If you asked me which is the biggest movement of the century, I'd say me too. The single biggest wave in the 21st century that has shaken and uprooted those in power. Those in the habit of abusing their power and silencing their victims. One hashtag traveled the world and exposed predators. Women from all walks of life came out to say me too. Just two words, me too. They took a lot to speak out. Even today, the consequences for the women who speak out can be serious. In China, the country's biggest tennis star has gone missing. She accused a former vice premier of sexual assault. She hasn't been seen since. Her name is Peng Shuai. We reported her story on day one. It's been 16 days now. Tennis stars from around the world, the biggest names, are now speaking out. China has been feeling the pressure. So it released a statement, apparently an email by Peng Shuai saying she's fine. The world doesn't believe she wrote it. Instead of reassuring her friends and fans, the email has raised concerns. Is Peng Shuai being held hostage in China? Is the Chinese state punishing her for exposing a sexual predator? On Gravitas tonight, we'll bring you the full story. Also on the show, China has built four villages on Bhutanese territory in the last one year. Satellite images show China's land grab. We'll tell you what this means for India. In Canada, it's a climate emergency. After record heat killed 500 people, floods are ravaging British Columbia. The government has deployed the Air Force. In India, the Supreme Court has passed a landmark verdict. You don't need skin-to-skin -skin contact, contact for sexual assault. The purpose of the law cannot be to allow the offender to escape, says the court. And the Miss Universe pageant is caught in the Israel-Palestine conflict. We'll discuss the absurdity of it. We begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. Amid rising tensions with China, Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen has commissioned 64 upgraded F-16B fighter jets, the most advanced version of the aircraft. The Polish army detained dozens of migrants who crossed the Belarus border and accused Belarusian forces of leading the operation. The Philippines has warned China to back off in the disputed South China Sea waters, accusing Chinese vessels of firing water cannons at its boats. The Pakistan parliament has approved chemical castration of those convicted of multiple rapes, aiming to speed up convictions and impose tougher sentences. This comes after a recent spike in incidents of rape of women and children in the country. Accepted that, that it was a, a mistake and that it was my mistake. Amid the Tory sleaze scandal row, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has admitted that the way he handled the findings of the report was a mistake. Europe becomes the epicenter of COVID-19 again as most EU countries including France, Germany and the Czech Republic announce a series of measures for the unvaccinated as number of coronavirus cases spike across the bloc. The shares of Indian digital payments firm Paytm tumbled 25% from the issue price today, with its profitability under question and the shares deemed over expensive. The IPO had gained lofty valuations in the country's largest ever share offering. For a second time in a month, exceptionally severe weather caused heavy rainfall and floods in Italy's Sicily. 
Garbinha Muguruza has become the first Spanish singles champion in the history of the WTA Tour Finals. The former world number one defeated in-form Estonian Annette Kontaweit 6-3-7-5 in the championship match to win her biggest title since the second of her Grand Slam crowns in 2017. Muguruza ends the year at number three in the world rankings, her highest in four years. Rory McIlroy has taken a two-shot lead after the first round of the DP World Tour Championships in Dubai. The two-time former winner made five birdies and an eagle on his first eight holes before signing off for a round of seven under. European Tour Order of Merit leader Colin Morikawa is in a group of ten players who are three shots off the pace, but his closest challenger Billy Horschel has a lot of catching up to do after struggling to two over par. Where is Peng Shuai? It's been 16 days now. Peng Shuai is one of China's biggest sporting stars. A former vice premier reportedly sexually assaulted her. More than two weeks back, she revealed her story. And since then, she's been missing. On the 2nd of November, she posted this. A complete account of the sexual assault, the horror that lasted 10 years, she said. China's former vice president, premier, Zhang Gaoli was named. Peng Shuai said he forced her to have sex and then forced her into a relationship. It was an intermittent and abusive affair that lasted almost a decade. Peng Shuai dared to go after one of China's most powerful men and now she's being silenced by the Chinese state. For two weeks, we've been telling you about Peng Shuai, the allegations, China's censorship, the global response and the solidarity from the tennis world. Leading names in world tennis have issued statements, names like Novak Djokovic, Naomi Osaka and Martina Navratilova. They want justice for Peng Shuai. What is China's response? Well, first they feigned ignorance, as if nothing had happened, as if silencing Peng and her followers in China will do the trick. It did not. Global criticism against China grew. The hashtag, where is Peng Shuai, started trending the world over. So China tried to kill the story with this sham. This is supposed to be the latest statement from Peng Shuai. It's on your screen. It is complete and total denial. It says the allegations of sexual assault are not true. It says Peng is at home and everything is quote unquote fine. So what happened here? Is this really a denial from her or is Peng Shuai being held hostage? And I'll tell you why I asked that. Because of the dubious nature of the statement that has been released. First of all, the statement was not released by Peng Shuai herself. It came from a Chinese state mouthpiece. It's an exclusive from CGTN or China Global Television Network. They are the ones who put out the statement exactly like this. There is no letterhead, no PDF, no piece of paper, just a screenshot. And it gets more bizarre. Let's zoom into the statement. I want you to look at the third line of the text. There's a cursor there. The kind you'll see when you open Microsoft Word to write something. It's right next to the letter A. You can see it on the screen. And we aren't the only ones who spotted it. A lot of people on social media are talking about this cursor, like this man. Is this really a statement from Peng Shuai? Or did someone from the Communist Party just type this up and released it in Peng's name? I know what you're thinking. Why is this cursor such a big deal? Maybe someone was just sloppy. They did not care to remove the cursor before releasing that statement. It happens. It makes sense. But it doesn't make sense when you hear the rest of the story. When CGTN released the statement, they said it had come in an email. Let me read out what they said. Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai has sent an email to Steve Simon, the WTA chairman and... CEO, CGTN has learned. This is what they said. So they say this was an email sent by Peng Shuai to Steve Simon, the chairman and CEO of Women's Tennis Association. Are emails supposed to look like this? Even the recipient of the so-called email does not believe it. We have a response from Steve Simon himself. 
And this is what it says. The statement released by Chinese state media concerning Peng Shuai only raises my concerns as to her safety and whereabouts. I have a hard time believing that Peng Shuai actually wrote this email we received or believes what is being attributed to her. The WTA and the rest of the world need independent and verifiable proof that she is safe. I have repeatedly tried to reach her via numerous forms of communication to no avail. He could not have been more direct. The highest ranking official in women's tennis is calling out China's lies on the record. You would now expect Beijing to say something, at least acknowledge what's happening. You'd be wrong. Even after today's events, China's official position has not changed. They're still pretending like it's not happening. Are there any other questions about Peng Shuai? Please ask them all in one go. My reply is very simple. This is not a foreign affairs matter, and I am not aware of the relevant situation you mentioned. Don't be surprised. China doesn't want to acknowledge the allegations because then it will have to take some action. And that will put China in a tough spot, which is why it is censoring the story at home. The so-called email was for the rest of the world. The sham of a statement was to silence the rest of the world. It has not been reported by domestic media in China. In fact, there's a blanket ban on news about Peng Shuai in China. When the story first came out, the Chinese censors went into an overdrive. They removed nearly 600 references to it from the Chinese internet, 600. Of course, they blocked Peng Shuai too. Her Weibo account was hidden. Weibo is Chinese social media. Her account was hidden. Comments on her profile were disabled. And that doesn't mean that no one in China has heard this story or read about it. Despite all the efforts of the Communist Party censors, the story did get out. Some feminist groups decided to protest. I want to show you what they did. Some buildings in China were lit up with these messages. Where is Peng Shuai? This is what they say. Me too in China. Say no to sexual harassment, gender-based violence and discrimination, and Chinese women breaking the silence. What a brave act in a country like China. We say more power to them. They're keeping the story alive. They're becoming the voice of Peng Shuai. And they're making the Chinese leadership nervous. Today's stunt by China makes two things very clear. Number one, China desperately wants to get this story out of its way. It wants the story to go away. And number two, the world should be worried about Peng Shuai's safety. This screenshot is not a word of assurance. It only raises concerns. It is an unsigned document released selectively to a state mouthpiece, to a channel that has a reputation of airing forced confessions from political detainees, CGTN. They've done it before. A few years ago, a couple appeared on this same network, CGTN, Peter Humphrey and Yu Ying Zheng. They were wearing orange prison vests. They were handcuffed. The couple was accused of trading personal information illegally. CGTN aired this across the world. The British media regulator Oxfam saw this as a forced confession. CGTN was not only fined for airing forced confessions, its license to broadcast in the United Kingdom was revoked. Peng Shuai's story is a bit like this one. It's like a hostage crisis where captors force hostages to record messages to show the world that all is well. So here's a question. Is Peng Shuai being held hostage by the Chinese state? The world needs to press Beijing for answers, demand verifiable proof of her safety. Until that happens, we won't stop asking the question, where is Peng Shuai? And Beijing has more answering to do. Take a look at this now. Satellite images from Bhutan. This is a disputed piece of land. China and Bhutan both stake claim to this. But in the past one year, structures have come up in this disputed territory. China is building villages here, not one or two, four villages in one year. This is a brazen attempt at land grab. Where are these new villages? Near the Doklam Plateau. 
That's where India and China were locked in a border standoff in 2017, Doklam. The villages were built between May 2020 and November 2021. The construction activity is still on. Like I said, four villages have already been built. They're spread across an area of around 100 square kilometers. China did not back down after the Doklam standoff. It just adopted a different strategy to grab more land and to coerce Bhutan to capitulate. Chinese diplomats went to Bhutan in October this year. They secured a Memorandum of Understanding, what's called an MOU. It dictated how China and Bhutan will settle their border dispute. And I'm going to tell you what the MOU says. But first, we must understand the Bhutan-China border dispute. Just like the border with India, China's border with Bhutan is also disputed, the whole of it. The border is 477 kilometers long. All of it is disputed. China claims seven territories in all. Three areas in western Bhutan, this includes Doklam, three regions in northern Bhutan, and one large chunk of its eastern region. China now wants a quick resolution of this boundary dispute, and in China's eyes, resolution means Chinese occupation. There is no other way to resolve a conflict for them. So they want the border, the border issue resolved with Bhutan. And this is where fresh construction helps. This construction allows China to create facts on the ground. With new villages and infrastructure, Beijing can put pressure on the negotiators in Bhutan. It can force them to submit to their demands. It can make them give up territory. And China is not just building villages here. In June last year, it staked claim on the Sak Ting Wildlife Sanctuary in eastern Bhutan. And this was the first time that China claimed territory in this region, in the east. So China's territorial claims are only expanding. Beijing is adding to its military infrastructure as well. Soon after the Oklam, it went on a building spree. It built accommodation for troops and helipads. A model village came up on the Mochu River. And all of this was allegedly happening inside Bhutanese territory. Now here's a question, where does all of this leave India? Bhutan does not have formal diplomatic relations with, with China. In the past, it has conducted its foreign policy through New Delhi. But Bhutan's MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding it signed with China, marked a shift. This was Bhutan directly engaging with Beijing. And this has two direct implications for New Delhi. Number one, it is diplomatic. Bhutan's decision to hold direct talks with China weakens India's position. Remember, during the Doklam standoff, Indian troops came to the rescue of Bhutan and Indian diplomats were the ones who negotiated a de-escalation. But now Bhutan's decision to directly engage with China on the border curtails India's role. That's implication number one, diplomatic. The second implication is border security. China's moves to build villages and infrastructure could give the PLA an edge. It's a standoff, if a standoff erupts again in Doklam. The Chinese have the edge. And Doklam is strategically significant for both India and China. There are two mountain checkpoints here. The Chumbi Valley, that is north of Doklam, and the Shiliguri Corridor, that's the south of Doklam. It's very simple. The Shiliguri Corridor is controlled by India. And this corridor connects the northeastern states of India to the rest of the country. But if China were to gain control of Doklam, it could cut off India's access to the Shiliguri corridor and to the northeast. And China is working towards it. It is building villages near Doklam as we speak. It is trying to kill two birds with one stone. Corner Bhutan into conceding territory and weaken India's position diplomatically as well as strategically. This is serious. New Delhi must respond to this latest threat from Beijing, even if Bhutan does not. For now, we'll shift to Canada, which is dealing with a climate emergency. Canada has been forced to deploy its air force to conduct rescue operations in British Columbia. That's because the province is dealing with unprecedented floods. Two days of torrential rain have submerged large parts of British Columbia underwater. The city of Vancouver is the worst hit. It has been cut off from the rest of the country. More than 18,000 people have been displaced. 9,000 homes are without power. Canada is calling it a once in a 500 year event. Here's a report 
on the scale of the tragedy and the steps being taken by the government. Situated in the westernmost part of Canada is the province of British Columbia, Canada's third most populous province. At present, it looks like this. Large swaths of British Columbia are completely submerged underwater. Rivers have turned into raging torrents. Mudslides have become a frequent sight. Highways have collapsed. Vehicles are stranded. Boats have become the new mode of transport. Cattle are being rescued through jet skis. Nine thousand homes are without power, and eighteen thousand people have been displaced. It is being called a once in a five hundred year event, triggered by just two days of torrential rains. Such is the scale of the tragedy. That an entire city has been cut off from the rest of Canada. Vancouver, mudslides have blocked all routes to Vancouver. Roads are inundated, bridges have been washed out, railway lines are lying non-operational, and all highways have been forced to shut down. The local authorities have declared a state of emergency. not just in Vancouver, but across the province. Please do not hoard items. What you need, your neighbours need as well. We are confident that we can restore our supply chains in a quick and orderly manner, provided we all act as we have been acting over the past two years. Back in the capital, Ottawa, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has deployed the Canadian Air Force to help with rescue and relief operations. Planes and choppers are flying to British Columbia to support supply lines, clean up the blocked routes and rebuild the properties destroyed. Hundreds of Air Force officials are on their way, thousands more have been put on standby. I can confirm that there are hundreds of Canadian Armed Forces members uh, currently headed to British Columbia to help with everything from supplies to evacuation to whatever is needed. There are thousands more on standby. We will continue uh, to work closely with the province, with Indigenous leaders, with community leaders to make sure that we are doing everything we can uh, to support the people of British Columbia through this incredibly difficult time. Canadian scientists at the University of British Columbia are attributing this disaster to the effects of climate change. They blame it on human-caused factors like wildfires and logging that increases chances of landslides. They also blame industrial activities for bringing such storms to the mountains. According to atmospheric scientist Rachel White, as we warm up the atmosphere, as we warm up the oceans, more water is evaporated from the oceans. So then when we have these atmospheric river events, essentially the atmosphere can carry more water towards our mountains. This dangerous trend is quite evident in British Columbia. It is being hit by one natural calamity after another. Just this summer, the same region suffered a record high heat wave. Temperatures soared to 43 degrees Celsius. As the heat broke records, more than 500 people died. Now British Columbia is reeling under floods. It is difficult to assess the cost of this tragedy right now. But observers say it could go on to be the most expensive natural disaster in Canadian history. Bureau Report, we on, World is One. 
speaking of disasters, let's talk about the one unfolding in the Sudan. Three weeks since Sudan's military, coups, military staged a coup, the country remains in the grip of violence. It's playing out on the streets of Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. Street confrontations have become a frequent sight here. On one side are anti-coup protesters. They want the civilian government to be restored. On the other side are security forces. They're shooting to kill. Wednesday was the bloodiest day since the coup took place. At least 15 people were shot dead by the paramilitary troops. One five, 15 people. The troops have, are said to have fired live rounds at protesters to disperse them. The protesters say they fired indiscriminately with the intention to kill. Yesterday's events have taken the overall death toll to 39. 39 people killed in three weeks. And this is the official figure. Reports say many other killings are still unac unaccounted for. These killings have failed to dent the resolve of the protesters. If anything, they've only strengthened it. Look at these images. They're from this afternoon. Thousands hit the streets of Khartoum with banners. And this included people from all walks of life, doctors, lawyers, laborers, students. They all rallied for hours chanting one slogan, no negotiations, no partnership, no compromise. It's a message to the Sudanese military that their movement will not stop, come what may. In another part of the city, protesters were seen blocking roads with piles of bricks. They're doing so to disrupt the movement of the military. They've also set up makeshift barricades. But they're no match for the military's might. Many of these protesters have ended up in hospital. They're injured, but still smiling. They say they want to be martyrs. And they've already bid their goodbyes to their families. People should not stop. I was beaten up, but I have to go back to protest tomorrow. It's good that I'm alive, but I wanted to be a martyr. I said goodbye before I left home. In order to stop the protests from escalating further, the ruling dispensation has shut down all internet services. There's a social media blackout in the Sudan. Telephone services have also been suspended. Last we checked, they had been restored in certain parts of the country. That was the latest as far as the developments are concerned. Now let's tell you the consequences of what's playing out in the Sudan, the wider implications of this turmoil and instability. It helps to begin with a map. The Sudan is located in northeast Africa. It borders Egypt to the north, Ethiopia and Eritrea to the south, Libya in the northwest and the Red Sea in the northeast, across which lies Saudi Arabia. Because of its strategic location, the Sudan becomes politically very important for regional stability in North Africa. The military takeover could intensify the Sudan's ongoing conflicts with its neighbors, like the one with Ethiopia. For decades, the Sudan and Ethiopia have been engaged in a territorial dispute. It remains unresolved due to ambiguity over border demarcation. There's a fear that this conflict could escalate with the military at the helm. So this is about the strategic significance. What about the economic significance of the Sudan? It is a country which is rich in natural resources like natural gas, gold, silver, zinc, iron and chromite. In January 2020, the Sudan opened up its gold market to generate revenue. The government was looking for ways to amplify mining operations. It was looking to strike deals with private companies from across the world. Those deals now hang in the balance after the, the coup last month. Then we come to the geopolitical ties. Last year, the Sudan and Israel agreed to normalize ties after the U.S. brokered a peace deal between the two countries. There's uncertainty over whether this deal would now sustain. Russia, too, had struck a deal with the Sudan. The Russian Defense Ministry handed, in fact, entered into a 25-year accord with the Sudan to establish a naval base in the country for Russian troops. We're not sure if the military is going to go ahead with all of these plans. The Sudan is significant for India too. For decades, it has served as a gateway for India's investments in the African energy sector. 
India is also the second largest exporter to the Sudan after China. Bilateral trade between the two countries stands at $1.3 billion. All of this could do go for a toss if the current turmoil persists in the Sudan. So it's of utmost significance to the world that they restore peace and stability in this country. A contest for beauty has turned into a contest for land. This year, Miss Universe is about Israel versus Palestine. The beauty pageant is being held in Israel. Many contestants and activists are now calling for a boycott. Why? In solidarity with Palestine, they say. So who is winning the crown? Let's find out. A campaign doing the rounds is selling the idea that there is no beauty in occupation. Israel is being branded as an apartheid state, slammed for occupying land and accused of whitewashing its crimes by hosting a beauty pageant. Just out of curiosity, why is Miss Universe being held in Israel? Organizers say Israel has wanted to host the event for long, plus the country's quote-unquote rich history, beautiful landscape, myriad cultures and appeal as a global tourist destination helps it make the cut. So the Israeli city of Eilat has been chosen as the venue for the 70th Miss Universe. The event is scheduled for December. Contestants are expected to arrive in a few days, but many are hesitant. Miss Malaysia, for instance, she's pulled out. The country blamed the Wuhan virus for this decision. The fact is, Malaysia has also long been a supporter of the Palestinian movement. Miss Indonesia has pulled out too. Why is that? We haven't been told. What we can tell you is that these boycotts have only emboldened activists. Meet Inkosi Malda Mandela. He's, Nel he's Nelson Mandela's grandson. Look at what he recently Instagrammed. And I'm quoting, There is nothing beautiful about occupation, brutality and institutionalized discrimination against the Palestinian people. He then adds, we must persist in isolating apartheid Israel in the same way we isolated apartheid South Africa. Not everyone in this country is convinced though. Among them is Lalila Maswane. She was recently crowned Miss South Africa. She now aspires to be Miss Universe. She has refused to pull out of the upcoming event in Israel. So the government of South Africa has refused to back her. Why is South Africa picking sides? Well, it has always been a supporter of the Palestinian movement. So for now, there is no Miss Malaysia, also no Miss Indonesia. Many more contestants are expected to follow suit and not attend. At least 19 countries had backed out from the last Miss Universe courtesy the Wuhan virus. Another long list of no-shows could dampen the contest. So the reigning beauty queen has stepped in to protect the prestige of a crown. This is Andrea Meza. Like I mentioned, she won the last Miss Universe. Come December, she's expected to hand over the crown to pass the baton. So Meza has sent out a message to all the contestants. And what better place to film this message than the city of Jerusalem? I definitely believe that Miss Universe is not a political or religious movement. So I think this is more about the women that are participating, you know, and embracing who they are. They are competing 70, 80, 90 women around the world for this title that is about empowering other women, about inspiring, about motivating to, you know, keep working, keep preparing themselves. So I don't think this should be viewed as a political movement. Here's a thought. There's a better way to empower women, inspire women, and help women embrace who they are. Just cancel the pageant. And not just this year, but for good, cancel it. Why do we even need a Miss Universe? In case you aren't familiar with the concept, let me quickly walk you through it. These beauty pageants are an annual affair. Every year, contestants from around the world gather in a city. Most of them are six feet tall, model thin and uncontroversial. Year after year, contestants are put through grueling sessions. For weeks, they are taught to be perfectly feminine, coached to wear their chin up, trained to not slouch while walking in high heels, instructed to wear a broad smile as the uncomfortable footwear eats their feet up. And then these women are tortured to waltz, tutored rather, to waltz into a room full of audience. Their ultimate goal is to make a mark, to win hearts and the crown. How do you do that? 
By wearing your hair perfectly, by draping gowns that reveal more than they cover, by waltzing around in traditional wear and looking just as good in a swimsuit. The contestants need to wear all three in three different segments to keep the audience entertained in between. The organizers of Miss Universe very kindly clip together pre-recorded messages, videos, where the lives of these contestants are reduced to a 30 second clip so one moment a contestant from Iraq is talking about the war in her country. The next moment she's paraded in a bikini with and without a sarong. She is then judged on her face and her body. In the end, the audience returns home with a message that a woman is only as good as she looks. Pageant organizers disagree. They say the whole idea is to endorse beauty with a purpose. And just to make their point, the organizers have accommodated a question and answer round. That too happens. The finalists must answer the questions quickly and with a smile. If the point really was to endorse intelligence slash purpose, could the Miss Universe organizers not have organized a model UN? Why parade half-naked women in high heels? This is unapologetic sexism. It is sexualization of women and somehow our society loves the very idea of it. Beauty pageants are held at school level, at college fests, even in offices, housing societies. It's as if the ultimate dream of every woman is to walk down a ramp. Well, I have breaking news. It is not. So if you really want women to embrace themselves, feel confident in their skin, start by shutting down these events. And if you really want to help find a solution to the West Asian crisis, step out of the bubble, we say. Because you know what? The Israel-Palestine crisis cannot be solved from the Miss Universe stage. In the United States, a silent pandemic is taking thousands of lives. It has killed more than 100,000 Americans in one year, 100,000 in a year. They were not killed by guns or car accidents or the flu. They were killed by medicine overdose, drug overdose. More Americans are dying from drug overdose and the last year had a record high. Here's a report. The United States is dealing with a hidden pandemic. In the past year, it has lost more than 100,000 lives to it. What is this pandemic? Drug overdose. It has touched a record high in the United States. The country has reported its highest yearly death toll from drugs. The data comes from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. It recorded 100,306 deaths till April 2021. All of these deaths were due to drug overdose. 46 out of 50 American states have reported a spike in such deaths. In total, deaths from overdose have shot up by more than 28%. Why are so many people dying from overdose in America? Experts give a long list of reasons. The first one is the pandemic. Lockdowns and pandemic restrictions isolated patients with drug addictions. They couldn't get the help they needed. So they took harmful drugs without consulting doctors. The second cause is the poisoned drug supply of America. Drugs that can cause harm have penetrated the US health system. A lot of victims took synthetic opioids. These drugs are manufactured in labs. They help patients get relief from pain by stimulating the brain. 75% of the deaths in the US were due to opioids. The trend has been a cause of concerns for years now. Drug overdose deaths in the United States increased by nearly 140% from 2000 to 2014. Since then, the numbers have only been on the rise. At this rate, the United States may be able to get rid of the Wuhan virus, but it will still struggle to save lives. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. Let me tell you a story from India now. It was December 2016. A man in his late 30s lured a minor into his house. The man told the child he would give her a guava. When the child was in his house, the man groped her. He tried getting her out of her clothes. The young girl's mother lodged a complaint. Earlier this year, the man was presented before a court. Under Indian law, he should have been sent to jail. 
what he did. He should have been given at least five years of rigorous imprisonment. He wasn't. The court allowed him to walk free. The judge said the man's behavior did not amount to sexual assault. The judge, by the way, was a woman. Justice Pushpa Ganediwala. She ruled that holding the hands of a five-year-old and unzipping the trousers do not amount to sexual assault under POXO. What is POXO? Protection of children from sexual offences. It's a law introduced in the year 2012 to protect children in India. It defines sexual assault as when someone touches a child with sexual intent or makes the child touch the person or does any other act with sexual intent which involves physical contact. Now, in this case, the judge saw no proof of physical contact, so she let the accused walk free. She said he could not be charged with sexual assault because there was no skin-to-skin -skin contact. I want to read out for you what the judge said in her order. Listen to this. As such, there is no direct physical contact that is skin-to-skin -skin with sexual intent without penetration. She went on to say the act of pressing of breast of the child aged 12 years in the absence of any specific detail as to whether the top was removed or whether he inserted his hand inside the top and pressed her breast would not fall in the definition of sexual assault. So the pedophile walked out of the court a free man. The news of this judgment spread like wildfire. It was slammed for setting the wrong precedent. The criteria for skin-to-skin -skin contact meant that anyone could put on gloves, grope a minor and get away with it, or touch a child without removing her clothes and get away with it. But why am I telling you the story tonight? Because India's apex court, the top court in the country, has set aside this verdict. It's a very important decision with far-reaching consequences. The Supreme Court of India has not been shy of calling out the absurdity of this verdict. The court said that when it comes to sexual assault, it is the intent that counts, not skin-to-skin -skin contact. And you must hear what the Supreme Court of India said. I'm going to quote again. The purpose of the law cannot be to allow the offender to escape the meshes of the law. What does touch mean? Simply a touch? Even if you're wearing a piece of clothing, they're not trying to touch clothing. We must see touch in the meaning that Parliament intended. And the court went on to say, we have held that when the legislature has expressed clear intention, the courts cannot create ambiguity in the provision. It is right that courts cannot be overzealous in creating ambiguity. It's a very progressive judgment and a much needed one. Do you know why? Because it involves minors. It affects children. It helps in deterring crimes against them. Every day India reports an average of 350 crimes against minors. Over 128,000 cases of crimes against minors were reported in 2020. At least 43,000 cases were filed under the POXO Act. This is according to India's National Crime Records Bureau. The skin to skin, skin criterion set by the lower court would have helped perpetrators get away. It was important to set aside the verdict. It was important that the little girl who was lured on the pretext of being given a, a, a fruit was given justice. Today, the Supreme Court of India has ensured that. And for that, we applaud the court's judgment. And on that note, we're wrapping the show, leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.